Welcome to the Swim Swim Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, we've got a very special guest. She was one of the 10 swimmers that Swim Swim named as breakthrough athletes in the 2020 ISL season. She recently became the number two all-time British performer in the 200 long course meter IM at the Manchester International, which we're going to talk to her about. Today, we are sitting down with Abby Wood. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm glad we were able to make this work and have a chat for a bit. Um, Let's let's start with that Manchester International meet. It was uh, the second week of February, Valentine's Day weekend. Um, I mean, it, it it looked like you were feeling it that weekend. What? How did you feel during that meet? I think I was just so excited to get racing again, like especially long course. Like obviously, ISO was so much fun, and I was just really like eager to back up my performances at ISO long course. So I think. Um, there was a massive novelty to racing again and it really didn't wear off throughout the weekend. And I think everyone at the meet or anyone like around the world who's starting to compete again, like it definitely feels like, um, like you're just happy to be there. And I think it just showed in my swimming really. Was that your first long course racing since COVID began? Yeah. So the last time I raced long course was, um, March, I think it was like March 21st, 2020. So it's like almost exactly a year on. So I don't know, like I wasn't too scared because we've done a lot of simulations in training. So I kind of knew where I was at. But um, yeah, I think the year break definitely, like my performances after the year break definitely shocked me because there was no like gradual um, like improvement. It was kind of just all like slapped in the face. And yeah, I was. it was definitely a weekend of a lot of shock. Yeah. So can you take us through your weekend and and each race you swam? Because you had quite a few good swims. Yeah. So first I just did the 400 free in the heat of the Friday, which is the first day. And that was just kind of to um, kind of like get some race endurance in me because I I, like my best friend used to be the 400 medley. And since I've dropped that now. Um, my coach kind of wanted to keep some endurance in my program just to make it basically was to make the 200s feel a lot easier which it was definitely nice and then we decided before I even swam the heat not to do the final and just to focus on the 200 breast which I did the heat and final of on Friday and I think that was the 200 breast it was like the biggest shock of the meet like I think it was like a four second PB um, which is like an age group a kind of thing to say and like I've never I'm never normally the type to drop that much so like the shock and I think just being with my teammate Molly made it so much nicer because it was the first time she PB'd in the event event since Rio and she obviously got the British record and we'd done a few breaststroke sets together and um I kind of just fancied entering a 200 breaststroke and yeah it's definitely something that I'll keep on my program now so yeah, to drop a 222, I was like, so, so shocked. And I think you could definitely tell on both our faces at the end that we did not expect that at all, especially like in just kind of like an untapered meet. And yeah. And then on the Saturday was a bit of a nicer day. I just had the 200 free. Um, and I think in the heats, I kind of just had the aim to go under... I just had like a race, I just had race processes in the heats and then I just raced in the final. So I worked on some processes of like my back end in the heats and then the final um, was another little PB, which was nice. Um, And then the 200 medley, no, on the Sunday I had the 200 medley and 100 free, which again for the 100 free, I just did the heat um, just to see like, where I was at in the event because I'd never usually do it and because I did I surprised myself at ISL in the relays my coach just wanted me to give it a go and that went quite well better than expected and then yeah the 200 medley like it was it just felt like that was my event and I was like I really want to show 
I want this one to work out like the others have worked out. Um, so yeah, to go under 210 for the first time was, um, yeah, that's like, I would say it was my highlight of the meet. <laughs> that's i mean yeah so you go t- three massive pbs in the in the 200s and then you also have really good swims in the four free and the hundred free and in prelims uh but does first of all i have to just looking ahead to the to the olympic games does this narrow your program at all Do, are you pretty set on events you're focusing on or that is that still up in the air with with so many to choose from i think it's um I think it's narrowed down like in my head, but obviously like I have to qualify for each one and like uh, like me and my coach will go through the programme, but I think it's the three 200s that I did at Manchester, the three that I'll focus on. So the 200 breast, the 200 free and the 200 medley. And I think the 200 free and the 200 medley were always two that I was going to aim for. And then I feel like the, the 200 breast shirt kind of has been added on since Manchester. Um, and I think I prefer having a busy schedule because it puts less pressure on one event. And I think that's what really helped me at ISL. Like I was very busy and I think I'm kind of someone who thrives on back to back racing rather than putting loads of pressure on one event. So for me, it's kind of like the more the merrier. So I don't see it as an issue. I see it as it's like good to have options if I like qualify on the events. Like, yeah, I'm not presuming anything, but yeah, they're, they're the free ideals. And then if Britain do any relays, I think it would be nice to be a part of some of like the 200 free relay. And I don't know, maybe the four by one. I don't know. I don't know. It's, I don't want to like say, like, oh yeah, I'm doing this, this and this, because technically I haven't even qualified yet. So, but that that's like the aims. Yeah. Totally understandable. Yeah, I should have phrased that as 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 events you're shooting for to qualify in or or at at your trials meet. Um, yeah, I don't want to back myself too much and make it sound like I'm very like I know I'm going and stuff. But yeah, yeah, you you have a, a lot of people don't understand you you do have to qualify and just because you've gone a time at one point doesn't mean you're automatically there. You still yeah, you, yeah, you, you still have, have to, to make that happen time. yourself. Yeah. Um, so, and then let's, let's focus on the tuner breast for a second. You go two twenty two seventy seven next to your teammate, Molly Renshaw, who swam a British record two twenty two Oh eight was is breaststroke a focus in training for you at all. Um, or was it more of a compliment for the IM? Um, well, I think breaststroke's always been my strength in the medley. Um, but before I kind of did medley, I, I used to like, be a breaststroker at an age group level like my first British record was in the 200 breaststroke um like the the age group record so like the 13 and under and that was my first and then when I moved to Loughborough like um they kind of wanted to focus more on medley and I'd say the 200 breast was always there but it was kind of put on the back burner and um I wouldn't say I've like particularly done more training for it but I'd say me and my coach have definitely focused on my breaststroke technique and I think it started to come through at ISL and then we just thought, oh, let's enter some um, 200 breaststrokes rather than it just being it's a leg on the breaststroke. Um, but yeah, I'd say the breaststroke and the freestyle improving is definitely a bonus for my um, the back end of my medley, yeah. I think that, well, that was the aim. That's why we've done more of it and raced it more to benefit the medley, but they're kind of coming into their own a bit as well on my programme certainly seems like they're coming into their own a bit, as yeah. you said. Um, that's that's really cool to see. And then the 2IM, uh, you become the number two British performer ever. You go 209.38, like you said, your first time under 210, first time under 211. Uh, yeah. Again, another age group-like drop. Yeah. Um, for, for that swim, have you been able to contextualize that at all? Just process it and, and think wow, I, you know, number two all time mm. in, in from Britain. Yeah, I think um, medley in the UK is definitely a strength with obviously Siobhan going the 206. So kind of still, it's hard to appreciate how, like, how good it was for me when I was thinking, oh, I'm still like three seconds off the British record, which is, which is almost, which is like the world record. And I kind of don't see it that way. So 
obviously like I'm really happy with the 209 but I still feel like oh god I'm still like three seconds away from the best which feels like a lot but I need to like appreciate that to going under 210 is a big achievement so yeah. <laughs> Did, did you have particular goals, times, or otherwise coming into this Manchester international meet? Um, I'd say from some simulations that I'd done in training, me and my coach, there weren't so much goals. He kind of spoke to me before and was like, what kind of times would you be happy with at this meet? And I kind of, like, we kind of read a few out. Um, and some were, like, far past it and some were... Um, Somewhere like on what I said, and um, I say like the two hundred nine was like around what I hoped for, um, what I hoped for, but I didn't, I didn't really think it was going to happen because it was at the end of a long weekend and I was getting tired, and I think I really had to like pull myself up, like pull through, and um, yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I think it was definitely unexpected going under 210 and that was probably like the aim of the meet, but it was like a big, it was a big push to want to do that at the end of the meet in the last session, like the last race of the meet. So I was very happy. Like it was a lot of relief when I did it. Yeah. I mean, and like you said, it's, it was the last session of a big week. You swam uh, six, seven, eight races, I think in three days. Um, and, you know, so that's, six of which were 200 and then one 400. And so it's, it's a lot of racing. It's a lot of K's, uh, but you're not unused to this. You were just coming off of this ISL season uh, where you had a breakout performance with the New York breakers. Um, you were on the breakers for season one, but you mm. only swam one meet with them. Is that right? Yeah. So I had to miss the first two because uh, we, do, we do an altitude training in Flagstaff and, the breakers were really that I was really lucky that they still wanted me for that one weekend, even if that was all I committed to. And obviously it's worked out in the long run because they wanted me back, but like they could have easily just said like, Oh, if you can't do all three, then like you can't go. And then it wouldn't have really set me up for season two. So I might have not have been even been at ISL if they were, if they didn't let me just do that one competition. So, yeah. How did how did that one meet set you up just expectation wise for being a member of the ISL? I think it made me realize that I was a really little fish in a big pond. Like it wasn't like the best meet for me, and I think it made it like obviously it made me realize that I did want to be involved in ISL. But if I did want to like make a mark on ISL, that I really had to pull my socks up for the next year. Um, so I think like it was definitely a benefit of doing the one competition. Um, but yeah, it definitely made me excited for next year, but it made me realize that I wanted to be in amongst everyone rather than, I think I like the highest place I got was like sixth, and I don't know. I just wanted to be racing with everyone rather than just kind of being a filler. Pull, pull my socks up. I love that phrase. I've never heard that, but that's, oh, that's really? great. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a British thing, but that, yeah, that's great. Because that, yeah, that's really like said a lot in England. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so then in that next year between ISL seasons one and two, obviously a lot happened globally. Um, yeah. most prominently the COVID pandemic, but how, you know, before COVID and after you know, and once COVID started, how were you metaphorically able to to pull your socks up for season two? Um, I think as I got into the long course season, like it did start to go well before everything kicked off. Um, I think I learned like a few two elevens in season, which has never really happened for me. Like I normally used to have to get a full taper. So I think the progression was starting to happen. And then it kind of just obviously like, it was just all completely taken away from us and it was real. it was quite annoying actually because I'd finally just got the ball rolling and um for it all to stop was obviously annoying and all swimmers will say the same but I think through lockdown like through lockdown it really gave me um kind of like a standard to aim towards because I was like right I've got the ball rolling like, I need to keep it going like this is my time and I feel like it was a lot of work behind the scenes um, and at home during lockdown that I had to just keep my head down and know that I'm, I'm going in the right direction and I don't really want to stop yet. So. 
And I know everyone's lockdown situation was so different and it's, it's been great for me just to hear what everyone ha- had to do during that time and what everyone got to do during that time, because some people had pool access, some people had backyard pools, some people had pools, in people's houses, and, and a lot of people just didn't have pools. What, especially when lockdown started, I'm, I'm pretty sure Britain was fairly strict and I think they still are, but what, what was your situation? What were you able to do and, and what did you end up having to do to, you know, keep that level? Yeah, so the first lockdown, there was no pools. Um, we're, ve- we're in our third lockdown now, but for the second and third lockdown, we're very, like, performing. Um, elite athletes are allowed to train. So at the moment, I'm in a group where I'm allowed to train. But in the first lockdown, like, obviously, no one knew what they were dealing with. So there was no pools at all open. So we kind of got sent out a weekly pa- plan, which we normally would if we were swimming. But on a weekly plan, it had, like, um, like spinning sessions. Um, we had weights three times a week that we um, had to go and pick up from uh, like gyms and stuff. And we got, we were lucky enough to all get a bike in my group, like a spinning bike. So we were just doing basically on Zoom, like what we're on now. And we were just all together as a group, but on Zoom. So we were on it twice a day. Um, and I actually got a job. Um, I went. I got a job as a key worker because I just wanted to get out and do something, and rather than just be in the house all the time. And I think that's what made training better. So I got a job working for my dad as um, like a bin woman, like a bin. You know, it's like just bin ladies. Like what do, I don't know what you'd call it in America. Say so like collect ru- rubbish collection. Yeah. Okay. Trash Easy. collection. That that's what we call. It. Yeah. You call it what? Trash collection. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I got that. Okay. And I think that was quite, it was really fun. It got me out of the house and it was really hard. Like I got like 15K of walking in a day. So um, I think that was like and, an added endurance. I don't know, maybe that's what's <laughs> like kickstarted the swimming again. Um, Wait, yeah, to be clear, you were, you, your job was just walking around from house to house and, and emptying and trash, and emptying sorry. rubbish. Yeah, okay. okay. Into the lorry, so it was not glamorous at all. Um, but I really enjoyed it, and I'm glad I did it because someone say that I did, and yeah, maybe all that endurance, and I think it made me realize how lucky I was to be able to call swimming a job, um, and it wore off the novelty of wanting to stop swimming and get a job. So, like, I want to put that off as long as I can now. So, um, yeah, but. We, I just did so the Zooms before and after work. And yeah, I just took every week as it came. And that lasted about, I think it was like 10 weeks that we couldn't swim. And that's the longest I've ever had out the pool. Um, but it definitely gave everyone a new perspective of how lucky we are to be able to travel around the world and swim for a job. So it was, I think it was a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Yeah, wow. That's it's certainly not something I've ever heard on this podcast yet. Um, that is no, that, that is pretty cool. <laughs> did I? I mean, I, ha- I just have to ask a couple more questions about that. Did Did you get that job just to get out of the house, or just to give you some activity? I think a bit of both. Like I knew it was an option. Like, um, and yeah, it was to get out of the house because otherwise I would have just been sat around waiting to do these two Zoom calls a day and. I'm very much a person who can't just sit around like um so at the moment I'm doing a degree as well as swimming because I think I just couldn't just swim but I always have to have like more than one thing going on so um I think it was I knew that I would struggle if I just did the zooms on with with our group so I think it was kind of just to have another thing going on and I was very lucky to be able to do it so I just took the opportunity really that, that's awesome <laughs> that's really cool did you get paid yeah yeah it's like a legit job yeah I got paid nice mm-hmm. um okay cool so, so so then you finally are able to get back into the pools and um before ISL how long were you able to swim and train for I think we were quite lucky I think I must have got in like the end of May uh, end of may start of june i think so i had a good couple of months and we kind of shortened our summer break that we'd normally have about a month off and we had 
um, like two weeks off. Um, and so, yeah, I felt in probably better shape than I normally would in October, November of a normal season because normally I would have only had like six weeks. Um, so I think that definitely benefited me. Um, so, yeah, I had quite a bit of time. Uh, that, that is nice. And then you come into the 2020 ISL Budapest bubble. And uh, mm-hmm. it, I mean, I think it's safe to say you sufficiently pulled your socks up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, Like I said, you were one of Swim Swam's uh, top 10 breakthrough swimmers for this ISL season. Uh, you scored a lot of points for the New York Breakers in IM, Brest, on relays. Like you said, you were super consistent. I, I think we... I remember reading you never you, – your, your fastest split in 100 free was 52.3, but you never split slower than 52.7, so you're super consistent. Um, and, yeah, I, let's get your perspective on that six – first of all, six weeks in a bubble, super weird or, or just very novel uh, position for a swimmer to be in. What was that experience like for you? I loved every second of it, like – it went so fast. I did not feel like I was there for six weeks at all. And I think um, consistency-wise, I think swimmers, you could go about it two ways, really. Like you could either taper throughout the meet into the final or try and maintain as fast as you can for the whole six weeks. And I think because I was on breakers and we didn't really know if we'd get all the way. So me and my coach sat down and said, I just want to be, um as fast as I can for as long as I can basically so I kind of just like <laughs> effort wise I went through I went I went into it from the first meet but it did get it like just like maybe I did get fresher as it went on and I think I did get quicker and quicker but my aim was just to be as consistent as possible and I think the drops that were really shown were only in the 400 medley and I think that was probably just because I didn't have as much training on my back by the end of the meet so yeah my aim going into it was just um to be as quick as can for as long as can rather than tapering into a final meet but with the breakers we didn't know when our last one would be you know uh so yeah if i'd gone to, for the route of tapering into the final then and we didn't do the final it would have all kind of gone wrong and i wouldn't have, i'd be quite annoyed that i didn't get to perform how i wanted to so yeah it's, it seems like you picked the right plan of action. The breakers, while well, they didn't make the final, they did make the semifinal, which uh, seemed like seemed like a good milestone for that team. Um, yeah. For you personally, did you have a meet or, or or a match rather that stood out to you? Is you were like, okay, this I was really on for this match, and uh, can you give us some context around that? Um. I think this probably the second match and the semi final. So, um, I think the first match was just getting into it because I hadn't competed in about six months, and then I think I shocked myself with my performances. So then for the second match, I was like, right, I want to be on it now. Like, I really want to go for it, and I think it showed. I think that was the one where I got the British record, which was my first senior British record, and I just remember being so like confident in myself rather than the first meet where I was kind of like, oh, I don't know where I'm at. And I think there was not maybe like a lot more nerves going into the first meet. And I think a lot of swimmers would have agreed because you just had, we had no idea where our performance would fall. Like it was really hit and miss and um, it went quite well. So then for the second meet, I was really, really excited. And then, um, so, and then, I feel like I tried to just stay consistent after the first meet and then the semi-final, I don't know what came out of me on the 400 medley, but I think I was just like, right, this is the last one. Like, I really just want to like get out of the bag and just do what I can. And um, yeah, I think definitely the second meet and the semi-final. Yeah. And do, it, you, yeah. Do, do you, no, no, no. Uh, do you remember what place you got in that 400 IM semifinal? I think I came third, but it was my quickest one by like three seconds. I think that sh- I think in the semifinal it showed that what routes teams had people had individually gone down. So some people were getting faster and faster and faster, and some people were doing kind of what I did. So I think when I 
won the 400 medley, I think I went like a 429, which won that round. But then by the semi, I think I went 425 and that came third. And it just oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it just shows that like people were definitely like targeting the end few meets and I kind of just got my time and myself kind of like raced them and kind of my time got dragged down because I was just racing people around me. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the results now you you were 425 six and you got third like like you said um in that semi-final in the 400 i am uh I, taking it back to the match two like you said that was your first senior british record was did that obviously as, as a kid I, i'm guessing that might have been something that you're like wow that would be cool especially since you were breaking age age records as as a younger swimmer breaking a first your first senior uh, British record did that feel how you expected it might have yeah I think it was such relief maybe not like a dream when I was um younger but like from the past like four years like I think the transition from junior to senior had been quite hard for me like in the junior on the junior scene like I felt like I was I think I was more of a bigger fish in a smaller pond. And then as soon as I went to senior, like I felt so irrelevant in this massive pond that everyone else was doing so well in. And I think I really struggled. And I feel like ISL was the first time that I was kind of um, getting close to the records and, and, uh, and then getting the record. And I feel like it was a relief that like these last four years have been worth it. And cause I did just try and stick at it really. And, hope it would pull through and then I think it was a lot of relief and I was like um like oh like it's it's getting somewhere now again and yeah it was nice to have that kind of feeling back that I used to get at a junior um meet and I hadn't really felt in a while I I feel like that is a boat that many swimmers can relate to that you know they they are really good when they are young and then the transition to being a senior swimmer to taking that next step isn't isn't always the easiest and it goes better for some than others. How, you know, you mentioned the, that four years, which is a long time, four years to kind of make that transition. Wasn't the easiest. Can you explain what, you know, what made it challenging and what you used to get through that period? Yeah. Well, the biggest challenge I faced was so straight after I'd done the junior meets, um, I did actually make worlds in 2017, like senior worlds. And, I kind of went into it very naive thinking, oh, I'm ranked seventh, like I can go in there, make a final and do this, that. And then I got to Budapest and I think I just freaked out. Like it was such a bigger scale than any junior event I'd been to. Um, And in the heats, I went at PB plus 10. I went, my PB going into it to make Worlds, I went like 437 for the four medley. Um, And then... Um, at the actual meet, I went for 47 in the heats and I was so embarrassed. Like it was so obvious that I was so far off my time because I was in a pretty good seeded heat and it was so obvious and I was so embarrassed and it was such a big audience. And after that meet, like, I was really ready to quit. And I think it was my coach that was just like, you need to put this into perspective. And he just gave me a load of examples of when it hadn't worked out for other British athletes at their first senior competition. And and then he was like, just look where they are now kind of thing. And I think that kept me going because um, they were people that I knew and people that I could like talk to about it if I wanted to. And I think you are very lucky if your transition goes smooth and you go straight to the top of the senior. And I think it's very rare. And I think I was just naive and I thought like, because I was a top junior, I could just go straight to the top on a senior level. And I think I just took the longer route and I don't know, maybe the shortcut is um, very limited to some people and they're very lucky if they can go straight from junior to senior. I mean, that's, that is, th- that's a hard fall, right? I mean, like you said, yeah, was, you, you went into so it, <laughs> you went into it maybe a little naive, but you know, it's like you're, you're seated seventh and it's just like, Oh, I'll have to, all I have to do is go a PB and I might make a final. And then you have a swim like that. And that really, brings you down to earth I'm sure um yeah yeah before the meet like obviously my coaches were going to be optimistic and we kind of like planned out like what 
and he showed me like what splits, what times we'd get a medal and I felt really ready. And then I just think maybe like we were maybe too optimistic and the fact that like I hadn't prepared myself mentally for what was coming. So, yeah. And, and like you said to, uh, well, up to this point, it's not like there had been a ton of challenges or, you know, the big meets you had been to, I'm guessing it had gone pretty smoothly. And so it's like, well, why not expect that this will be the same way? Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, so that sounds like a, a hard thing to get through. And like you said, you know, almost, almost retired you, but you kept going and, and what, how did you, how were you able to change that mentality over the next few years? I think it was very gradual. Like I just gained more and more experience over like the next four years. Like don't get me wrong, like, I was very lucky to, I was still like making teams because of the times that I'd gone and um, the times that I did at not so big meet. So I still could, I still could like get a, like a sub 440 out of me at any trials I did. So I was lucky enough to go to like Commonwealth Games and Europeans. And I think gaining the experience then I feel like it, it kind of just improved a little bit every competition so like I had final at commies and that was my first international final at a senior level and then um yeah and then I feel like over lockdown like my mentality really changed that I was just so lucky and I was kind of just at a point where I was like well there's nothing else to do during lockdown so um like it was just a time for me to really focus on my swimming and yeah I think I definitely appreciated everything more and stopped looking at the negatives of what had happened in my swimming and it was kind of like the last push like I'm turning 22 next week so it was kind of like if not now when kind of thing I've always had a dream to go to the Olympics so like I need to get in gear and yeah pull my socks up (laughs) um what when are your trials um april Um, coming up yeah then i think it's like six weeks away now so it's getting closer okay were you in a position at all to make the olympic team i guess five years ago now did you compete at the 2016 trials yeah i went to the trials um I think I came third at the trials and you had to come top two and get the time. And I think I was about a second or two. Mm, I can't remember. I think I was a few seconds off the time, but I was I was in the mix kind of thing. I didn't have an expectation to make 2016, but I was like in and around it. Like I came third out of the girls and um I was still I still made a junior team that year so I feel like it wasn't it wasn't like a big I, I didn't really expect to make 2016 like I was like I was 16 then so it would have been un, like unreal if I'd made it then yeah do but you I feel think- like <laughs> do you feel like getting that experience at the trials and just being there and getting to race there you feel a little more prepared heading into this one yeah, like I kind of know now like how big it's hyped up that year. Like, I don't know. I feel like in Britain, like most trials are kind of the same, and I feel like so this year might can it might feel the same for me really as other trials. I feel like somewhere in America, like we see like your streams and you have like all the flames, and it's like <laughs> a massive event. But for us, and especially this year, like I don't think it will be as big up, which. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I'd, I think it's a good thing because I won't get overwhelmed. Um, but, like, obviously, American trials, like, us Brits look at it and think it looks amazing. And, yeah, it would be amazing if Britain bigged it up to that one day, if the sport got bigger in the UK, if swimming got bigger. I, I love that you said that because... It, it, because Olympic trials in America is a big deal, especially in the swimming community. Yeah. And yeah. we're like, Oh, it's, it's unlike any other meet. But if you, if you're talking to someone or a fan and they've been to an Olympic trials, the, the first thing they'll say is, Oh yeah. And the fire. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah the fire ever- <laughs> no, I think we had a Europeans once. Um, but yeah, no, we've never had it. Uh, isn't it like in a stadium or like an arena as well? It yeah. Is. It's, 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 
Yeah, it's in a stadium. It's a huge event, but I think that's the one thing that really makes it stand out is everyone's like, oh yeah, and then they like announce the, who's on the Olympic team and then like the huge flames. Yeah, like all we do, well, I'm not, I, I've never had it, but like I think all the people that make the team get is just an email like a week later. <laughs> it's definitely not as big as that. Uh, that's still pretty cool. I'm I'm sure getting that email is is, is like having fire go off in your face. Oh yeah, like, if, if you get yeah, it, it's just happy, but it's definitely toned down in the UK. It got and and like you said, especially in a year like this, I'm guessing ours will also be uh, severely toned down, and and I'm you know I'm, I'm guessing everyone's trials would be as well. Um, but that's that's exciting that your trials are coming up. Do you feel? Uh, in these next few weeks, is is your mentality changing at all, or do you feel that excitement level rising, or maybe those nerves rising? I think it's definitely more exciting. I feel like Manchester meet has definitely taken away my nerves from the pressure of trials. Like I feel like I know now that I'm in a good place, and it's definitely more excitement than nerves at the moment. But I don't know. I could get there. And- it won't be a repeat of 2017 Worlds nerves, but I think when I get there, I will get some butterflies and um, hopefully I'll use that to my advantage because I do swim better when I have some like butterflies in my belly. So, yeah. Uh, just heading off of swimming for a minute, uh, you're at Loughborough University. Uh, mm-hmm. Before we got on, you said you, you're just finishing up your dissertation. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about your time there and, and how you think your schooling has impacted your swimming? Yeah. Um, well, Loughborough's a um, sport university anyway. Like that's kind of what we specialize in. So um, they're very flexible and I've been able to like split my third year of my degree over two years. So these last two years have been a lot easier workload wise. And um, it's where the, British Swimming National Centre is based. So kind of like the place to go is for like swimming and uni is kind of like Bath, Loughborough and Stirling up in Scotland. And I think it's definitely like the optimal place for me to do my degree alongside swimming. And I feel like it's kind of worked seamlessly. Like I've not really had too many problems. And it's definitely good for me that I have uni to like, take my mind off swimming so it doesn't overwhelm me as much i know for for us in the united states loughborough has become a much more relevant place on the map just because so many of uh the stars that have swum in our collegiate system in the ncaa are now getting master's degrees at loughborough and training there as well um and it's some are competing for the school i think some are just training um but we've we've it's definitely popped up on our radar more and it, the, the training groups there are, uh, it's like pretty, pretty sizable. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think of, of the training group there and how that's impacted your last few years. I think like, obviously, uh, I think Adam's definitely put Loughborough on the map in the swimming world. And I feel like that's probably made the, it stand out more and more, um, and then obviously we have like uh, the groups filled with like so many like world medalists, um, European medalists, like Commonwealth champions. Like I think it's definitely like a domino effect. Like when you see others doing well in your group, like it definitely pushes you on. And just how they like present themselves at training and how they um, perform every day, day in, day out. I feel like it definitely wears off on us younger swimmers. So like when Adam joined, I was only 16 and just seeing that every day and like seeing like a handful of people that I train with compete at Rio and like watching them on telly, like it definitely feels like, well, they're training in Loughborough and doing this, like, why can't I do the same? And I feel like as the name of Loughborough has grown, it's definitely attracted more swimmers. Um, So that's probably why it's just getting um, bigger and bigger, really. Who who is specifically is in your training group? Because I, I I'm pretty sure there's a few different groups, correct? Yeah. So there's two groups in the national centre, and then there's the uni group as well. Which the uni group is kind of where there's more international swimmers, so like Felix Ubeck, hmm. and oh god, put me on the spot, like Marie Wattle, 
as well um, from France. And then in my group, um, it kind of started off as like the endurance group, but I'd say like both. And then Mel's group would be like the sprint group, but it's kind of turned into like who fits who better. So I'm with Dave Hemmings alongside like the Litchfield brothers. So Joe and Max, um, James Wilby, who was Commonwealth champion and always up there with Adam. Um, and then... Uh, Molly Renshaw, obviously, who I was with on the 200 breaststroke in Manchester, um, and then some other successful junior swimmers. And then in Mel's group, there's obviously Adam, and then Sarah Vasey, who's like world's finalist, Luke Greenbank, who's world third in 200 backstroke. So he kind of made it a less of a sprint group because um, he just he'd worked with Mel for longer. So it's definitely a big handful of people who are successful. Yeah, it's that's, so nice to be a part of, and it the, like everyone just bounces off each other. Really, that's that's great. Yeah, is there is there a lot of interaction between those two groups, or like do do swimmers switch groups ever? It has happened in the past, maybe not more recently. Um, but like we do come together to like do our simulations, like a, a chance to like race each other, and we all have the same pool times, like, and we do pre pool together. So it is more one group, but we just split when we get into the pool kind of thing. So like I'll see all of Mel's group like twice a day, every day. And like we do pre-pool together and gym, and like weights in the gym. We all do it together as a group. So it's very much like one group and then just split into two and we get into the pool. That's That sounds pretty great. And it sounds like, like you said, there's been success and that's just snowballed and snowballed. And now like everyone you mentioned is a, uh, is, is a very elite swimmer on, on the world stage now, which is exciting for uh, for this coming summer, certainly. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Abby, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat with me today. Uh, any parting thoughts before we sign off? Oh, none that I can think of unless you have anything else to quickly ask. But um, no, I'm just so excited for trials really and then take it from there. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.